Steve's going to come talk. Right. Yeah, Steve's going to in intro us. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, great introduction. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Is there, can you guys hear me? Is this mic, mic on? Yeah, it's a little better. Uh, thank you. How's everybody doing today? Okay? All right, good. Hope you're having a good show. Uh, I am Steve Kabelski. I'm president of Ticket Galaxy. Uh, we're the country's largest secondary market ticket broker, uh, and we're proud to partner with many uh, pro sports teams, venues, and live entertainment events to help them optimize their secondary market. Um, here in the Bay Area, we're the exclusive partner of the San Jose Sharks. Uh, we're the only person they work with on the secondary market. We're the largest season ticket holder with the San Francisco 49ers, and the same with the Giants. Uh, so we're big, we've been around, we love what we do, and we're very good at it. Um, you know, we, uh, we work with them and many other teams to help them learn more from the secondary market, figure out how they can leverage their own business into the secondary market, uh, improve the way they do their ticketing operations, uh, and many other aspects of their business. So I hope that we may work with many of you in the future. So I'm not going to plug my business anymore. That's, that's about it. Uh, mostly, I just want to say I'm really excited to be up here today, um, you know, sponsoring lunch. Uh, for anybody who was here last night who went to Levi Stadium, like you couldn't help but come away from that place just thinking that it was like a truly first class venue in every way, like really just amazing. And, um, you know, the one thing, though, I was a little bit disappointed. And, uh, you know, it was great, Bill, you know, fantastic job. But I was shocked that we didn't get to go through the Niners Museum because I had the privilege of seeing it firsthand uh, about two or three months ago when I was here on business. And I'll tell you what, like, I am a lifelong New England Patriots fan, but I came out of that place, man. Like, I wanted to root for the Niners. Like, it was just, it was incredible. Um, you know, it gave you such a, like, a, a great sense of the, the rich tradition and the history here of football. You know, some of the failures uh, early and then the eventual successes of that program really just, like, you know, amazing. And, and uh, you know, like, you're in there. And, like, the, my favorite part, you know, personally, is you walk into this, this big hall where they have all kinds of memorabilia and things. And there's literally, like, this life-size bronze replica of Dwight Clark, like, kind of reenacting the catch, like, suspended midair. You know, it's things, like, must be, like, eight feet off the ground. I, I don't know how you got up that high. It was amazing. <laughs> um, but it's just really, you know, it puts in perspective what a, a great accomplishment that really was. And, um, you know, I'm not here to really do like a formal introduction of Dwight, but um, I'm just really very excited to be up here uh, sponsoring the lunch, um, you know, participating in a small way and uh, really looking forward to hearing him speak, as I'm sure all of you are as well. So um, if anyone wants, wants to know more about the Niners Museum or about Ticket Galaxy, how we can work together, uh, you know, feel free to see me after the show. Uh, or you can email me, steve at ticketgalaxy.com. Thank you. No, no, wait. I got. I need. Um, you need tickets. I need tickets to Boston <laughs> at the Mountain Winery on June 30th. Done. I'm your guy. <laughs> Let me give you my card. Yeah. Let's do a little business. There you go. Cool. See, and who says business can't be done here with pleasure? Are you guys enjoying lunch? Thank you again. All right. Thank, Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. I guess we'll start off with the most obvious thing about Dwight Clark, and that's really Clemson. How was uh, playing at Clemson? Well, first of all, before we get that, hello, everyone. <laughs> Are there any 49er fans here? Oh, yeah. yeah, a few? <clears throat> all right. I heard there were going to be some Raider fans here, so I didn't bring my Super Bowl rings. <laughs> Are there Raider fans here? Yeah. I thought so. So I made the smart move. All right, so just wanted to say hello to everybody, and, uh, so, and we'll get started. So, how was Clemson? It was awesome. There were uh, 11,000 students when I was there, and there were 6,000 girls. So it was, it, it couldn't have been Paris. better. Yeah, it was, for an 18-year-old, it was beautiful. Now, I mean, I'm sure that helps, especially when, you know, you've done some great things in your life, especially the 1994 direct-to-video Kindergarten Ninja. Kind of tell us about that and, you know, being, on, being in that type of studio production. Has anyone ever made, like, a bad mistake that <laughs> follows you around? <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I, I retired from football, and uh, I was just sick of running, so I started taking martial arts. And the guy I was taking martial arts from had like 10 studios, 2,000 students. And he wanted to motivate them to do so. So he said he was going to make a movie. And the movie was going to be sold to the kids 
and they could be in it if they were like one or two in their class or did their katas right or whatever. And so he asked me to be in this movie. And my wife at the time told me, she says, you're gonna regret doing this. It was one of the one things she was right about. <laughs> so so I, was, I did regret doing it because I didn't know social media and eBay and all that was going to even happen. So now this freaking movie that I thought was just gonna be sold to help raise some money for, you know, for D.A.R.E., which was something against drugs, um, <laughs> which was a great deal, you know, right? So. Uh, so I did this movie, and now it keeps popping up like this. <laughs> well, you, so you don't even to... try to go buy it on eBay because it's totally sold out. You do not want to see it anyway. It's like, <laughs> it's so bad, you won't get through the first 10 minutes and you'll say, he's right, that was a big mistake. Until, of course, it's seen on Mystery Science Theater 3000, right? What? <laughs> exactly. They'll have, they'll have the guy <laughs> skewered at some point. Now, you were coming over from the player side of the business over to the business model itself to become that GM. What was that transition like? And was it something that, you know, really, as you see today's players start to make that move themselves, is that easier in that time or was that more difficult because of the lack of information that was maybe around there? Well, yeah, so I played for nine years and then um, I went into the front office at like a low, lower level position running uh, training camps and setting up mini camps that, you know, that kind of thing, working hand in hand with the head coach. And then I worked myself up to where I was the uh, director of football operations. But that first year, it wasn't, it wasn't bad for me because I had just retired. Um, it was a great transition for me because a lot of guys will retire or get cut and then they're just totally out of football. They're moving back to their hometown and they're just totally out. They don't have contact with anybody. Well, I was in the office every day seeing players every day. So it was, uh, it was a smooth transition for, for me uh, because I, I got to go from player to, you know, not being on the field, but at least I felt like I had something to do with the team's success if they had success. So you have this famous play, the catch. Now, everyone can always hear exactly what you felt about the catch, but there are so many viewpoints on the catch. Is it roughly the, amount of, the same amount of viewpoints you might see in the Zapruder film? Everybody seems to have an angle on it. How many <laughs> angles have you heard? Oh, I've mostly from the Cowboys fans, I hear. <laughs> It was a lucky play. Hail Mary, Joe was throwing it away, and you just happened to jump up and catch it. But the catch, everything that happened with that play was exactly how Bill Walsh talked about it in practice. We would practice the play, and he would say, okay, don't throw an interception, Joe. Either throw it high where it goes out of bounds or where Dwight can jump up and catch it, but don't throw an interception. And, you know, so... When Joe rolls out, when we were practicing it, he would throw it way over my head or hit me in the chest. And Bill would say, Joe, no, way up where you can get it or all the way out of bounds. And in the game that sends you to the Super Bowl, Joe's on his back foot with two people right in his face and he puts it in the exact spot that it has to be. Everson Walls was right beside me. And he, he's told me many times that when he looked back, he just thought he relaxed because he thought it was going out of bounds. And that allowed me to, because I knew what the play was all about, I knew he was throwing it to a spot. And, you know, the magic of Joe Montana, he puts it right where it has to be. The only thing I don't like about what Joe says is he thinks instead of the catch, it should be called the throw. <laughs> And I, I keep telling, you know, you did that a million times. I had one catch. Let me have it. The completion. The completion, yeah. There what you a, go. Okay, <clears throat> you were a GM at two major NFL franchises, the 49ers and the Browns. Here's my question to you. With all of the analytics we see today and all the new trends, do you think that you would have been great in this era being a GM? Or is it now a challenge because of the other variances that you see coming into the field of play? Um, I think I would have been the same. I was more of an organizer. I was not uh, great at picking talent. Um, I 
if I saw a guy, especially receivers, that I thought was good, I could usually pick out a receiver that I thought was going to be good. But uh, as far as picking out talent, that wasn't my thing. My, my thing was more organizing all the guys because you have, that's the one place upstairs when you're in management where you really do have a team. You've got six area scouts, two or three pro scouts, all the coaches, uh, all the heads of the pro scouting and the college scouting. And you gotta coordinate all that so you come up with a final grade. You, you know, everybody watches tape, everybody gets to write a report and then talk about what they saw. And then you start to come up with uh, a list of guys by position, and then um, a list of guys overall. And coordinating all that and organizing all that is, is kind of what I did. I, I think the technology now would help me do that even more, but my thing wasn't really picking players. The couple players that I insisted that we take every, you know, out of the eight years that I did it, yeah, just okay. Not real good. Yeah. So you're saying that Kevin Costner's draft day is not based on your life then? You know what? I, my, my best friend from high school called me. He said, man, you got to watch this movie. It's like, I mean, not only is it like when you were at Cleveland, that you and that dude look alike, you know? And I was like, yeah, no way. But, uh, but yeah, I haven't seen it, so I can't really comment on that one. Yeah, there you go. So now he has, you know, some film to watch at home. Other than Kindergarten the, Ninja that yeah. I watch all the time. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Now you're rebuilding the new Cleveland Browns to come in and actually take an entire team from scratch. How do you do that? And what's the least important thing that you have to worry about compared to the most important thing? Wow. Uh, so it was it was very difficult because uh, I got to Cleveland uh, like December 1st of 99. The expansion draft was like mid-January, so six to seven weeks away. Uh, then right after that was uh, free agency, and then right after that was the draft. And while you're doing all that, you're trying to put an organization together. You're trying to hire scouts that are under contract, uh, hire a director of football, people that are under everybody's under contract so you're quietly calling these guys and saying you know at the end of the year what do you think you, you know because it was it was just tough to find but people that were unemployed probably weren't that good or they got screwed somehow you know so uh, it was it was kind of tough to to put all that together um, the the toughest thing we had to do was find the time I mean we we were there from we would just sleep. I'd sleep in my office, you know, four days a week that f those first couple months because we were so far behind. But um, it turned out to, to be okay. We, uh, by the third year, we had a team that was competing to get in the playoffs. Um, we didn't make, uh, we had a chance and we, we our owner wanted a, a, like a signature guy that turned out to be Tim Couch that turned out not to be very good. But uh, he wanted a, a, a name guy, the face of the franchise, because we had a chance to trade the first pick with New Orleans for the fifth pick and all the rest of their draft. So we would have had 25 picks instead of just the, the 12. And we should have done that, uh, but our, our owner just, decided that he wanted to, and we all liked Tim Couch at the time. We hired our, our, the fifth guy that we interviewed is who we hired as head coach. There were four other guys we wanted, and we got the fifth guy. And uh, he said he was gonna run the West Coast offense, which is what Carmen Policy and I really knew, and he, Carmen was the reason I went to Cleveland. And uh, he just didn't know the West Coast offense like Bill Walsh knew it, few do, but, uh, but he was running an entirely different offense. I can't even think of the guy's name now. That's how bad I wanted him out of my hat. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was, that was tough. That was a tough time. We've seen some hybrid head coach GMs try to do both roles. Is that necessarily good, especially when it comes to player negotiations for contracts or drafts or anything else? Yeah, next to impossible to do it all. There's just not enough time. Um, 
if you're like uh, the head coach that has all the power, you need somebody you can really trust. Or if you're the GM uh, that has all the power, that's typically the best situation because they have time to organize it all. They don't make decisions emotionally. They, uh, they make it for what's best for the organization instead of what's just best for the team. How do you have a good relationship with your owner, but also a good relationship with the players? Because sometimes they don't necessarily always see eye to eye when things get in the press. As the head coach? As the, even the GM. Yeah. Um, well, it's easy to have a good relationship with the owner because you just kiss his ass. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's got all the cash. Yep. He, um, <laughs> he, he makes the decisions. Uh, at, uh, he leans on you because most of the time the owners don't really know what's going on. Jerry Jones thinks he knows what's going on, but I don't, I don't know. Some of this, you let that running back go when the, with the year they had, it kind of proves that don't really know unless they have something up their sleeve. But, uh, but our owner at, in Cleveland, um, he let the football people make all the decisions and he was, he was awesome. But Eddie DeBartolo was just incredibly generous, um, stayed out of it, you know, when, he, he did step in every now and then. Uh, Bill Walsh, Joe Montana's last couple years, Bill Walsh wanted to trade him because he, Joe was getting beat up and he was getting kind of older. And, and Bill's theory was always get rid of him a year early instead of a, a year late. And so he wanted to trade Joe to San Diego. And it was, it was like so close to happening. And Eddie stepped in and, you know, and stopped it. And then they go back to back Super Bowls with Joe Montana. Mm. So that was, that was the right move. So Eddie DeBartolo does know a lot about football, apparently. Okay, so you were in this nice new facility in Cleveland, but this transitions from Candlestick, which was our dump. Kind of yeah. explain the difference our in dump. that and kind of how that kind of works. Well, the, yeah, the real comparison is Candlestick versus Levi. Mm. I mean, Levi is just, it's just an incredible place. It's like a five-star hotel with a football field out back. You know, it's... It's beautiful. The, the, uh, the teams are competing with people that are sitting at home with 75-inch TVs and the ability to watch two or three games at one time with your bathroom 10 feet away and your beer right behind you. Uh, so it's tough. That's, that's tough. But um, there's nothing like being at the game in case you know, something great happens. You can say, you know, I was there. And, and so the the teams, I think Levi's done an awesome job of making it very comfortable, except for that one side that gets like to 110 degrees. But there's a, a little area to go, a little club area where you can go and watch the game, huge TVs, all the beer you can drink, the food's great. I, I think they compete very well with, with the home situation. And, you know, Candlestick was just, I wish everything could have been built right on that property just because of all the history that was that happened at Candlestick. That's what I was hoping for. But I understand why it didn't happen and why they had to move down there. But uh, but Candlestick was just rough. Really, as everybody that's been there knows the narrow concourses, the the troughs in the restroom. <laughs> just it was the field was it was terrible. It was good for me. I, was, I wasn't the fastest guy, but I've got big wide feet, right? So the field was actually mushy, like a sponge. The, I guess when there was high tide, the water would come up under the ground and it would be mushy. So I could take guys to that. There was a part where the infield used to be and it was really mushy. So I could catch a pass and take off across there. And it was like, I was running with duck feet, and those guys would sink. They, they, they couldn't catch me. So I, I love Candlestick. I've, I've, got, uh, I've got great memories from Candlestick. One of the things you mentioned with Levi Stadium is the fact that it's so big, but it's got all these premium areas, all these different kind of select things. I think that the troughs were probably the only premium area that were in Candlestick. <laughs> uh, I mean, kind of explain to me that little difference of dichotomy of now you're faced with this giant you know, kind of atmosphere by comparison of something that really didn't maybe serve the fan in the same way. Yeah, the, it's, it's 180 degrees. The, the, it was ter Candlestick was terrible for the fans, but it was where all the history was made. You know, all the Super Bowls, 
all the championship games, everything was happening right on those field or right on that field. And then you got this beautiful place down at, uh, at Levi's and, um, and no drama, no history, you know, no, but it's only been one year. So everybody, I think, just has to take a little break and take a deep breath. It's going to happen sooner or later. You know, if it's with this team or next year or the year, it's going to happen again. Um, there's going to be great drama in that place, great wins, something that people will be talking about like they do when they're talking about the catch. So put your GM hat on for a little bit. There's a young Dwight Clark who's out in the draft. Do you draft him? And if so, do you draft him in the 10th round? Hell no. <laughs> I don't know what Bill Walsh saw. So you're talking about being in the right place at the right time. My roommate was Steve Fuller. He's the ACC player of the year at Clemson. And he's like a really good player. Bill Walsh is the new head coach of the 49ers. And he comes to Clemson to work out Steve Fuller. And so, like I said, he's, he's my roommate. We live in this apartment. I'm walking out the door with my golf clubs on my shoulder and the phone rings. And so I, I'm like, God, do I really want to answer that? Because I know somebody's going to want me to do something and I want to go play golf. And anybody that plays golf knows why. So um, I, actually, I go back and I answer the phone and the guy says, hey, this is Bill Walsh. I'm the head coach of the 49ers and I'm in town to work out Steve Fuller. I was like, well, that's cool. Hold on a minute. I'll uh, let me get him. And he said, wait, who is this? And, and I told him and he said, didn't you play wide receiver? And I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, well, look, could you come and run the routes while Steve works out so I don't have to catch the ball? I can look at Steve and evaluate him. <laughs> I was like, yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. So I go to this workout and Steve has one of those really tough days. He's throwing it everywhere and I catch every pass up high low behind all that so after the workout Bill he says uh, could you to me he says could you like hold on for a second and I was like sure so he goes and talks to Steve for a minute and he comes over and he said look uh, I'd like to go watch some tape with you it was like coach I only caught 11 passes in my senior year and he said well is there a, a game where you caught two passes I said yeah yeah, I, against North Carolina, I caught two passes. <laughs> I was quite proud. So we go and watch the game, and most of the game, all I'm doing is blocking. I was huge receiver in 1979. I was 6'4", 220. Now they're 6'6", 260. You know, now they're huge receivers. But back then, in a West Coast offense, Bill Walsh was looking for a big receiver to go across the middle and take punishment and all that. Well, I didn't know that. So we watched the North Carolina game, and one of the passes I caught was across the middle, up high, and just get nailed, hold on to the ball, you know. And he, since I'd only caught two passes that game, he ran that play back 10 times, you know, <laughs> just to, and so ultimately, I ended up getting drafted by the 49ers instead of Steve Fuller. So right place at the right time. So <laughs> So you've had so many great uh, moments in the NFL and, you know, so many lists that you're on and, you know, retired by the, you know, 49ers, your number and all of this stuff. But what is the one thing that stands out in your entire career? Is it even something maybe minor to us that you feel was major to you that has always kind of been there and you've always wanted to talk about? Well, I, I get asked that quite a bit. The, um, the two moments that stand out to me was right after the catch, you know, it spiked it and you get hugged by all the players that are on the field right there and the whole stadium's going nuts. But there was nothing like running back across the field to all your teammates and coaches that are jumping up. And, I mean, there's 51 seconds left. We're going to the Super Bowl, you know, and I had, a little, you know, one of 11 guys that just made that happen and running back across the field after making the play that helped your team get to the Super Bowl. That was, that was like the highlight of my career was running across it. Second thing was running out onto the field for the first Super Bowl. It was, it was truly that feeling of being on cloud nine. You know, I, I go running out there and I swear I, could, I couldn't even feel my feet. I felt like I was floating above the ground. 
and I must have been totally overwhelmed because I, I take off and I'm running down the sideline. You know, I take in my warm up lap and I look over and everything is orange on this sideline. So I had run down Cincinnati's sideline <laughs> instead of the 49ers side. So I just went all the way around like I knew what I was doing. <laughs> Well, great. You know, uh, what are the humorous locker room stories that you might be able to share with us? You know, hopefully nothing too horrible. No, no. <laughs> well, we had great practical jokers. Um, let's see. Um, so there was, the, uh, there was the fake get a turkey free thing. Uh, Thanksgiving week, our equipment guy would get like letterhead from Safeway or Rayleigh's or whatever. And write a letter as if it was from the president of Safeway, come down and get your free turkey. Safeway had no idea that what it was about it. But so they would put it in everybody's locker and all the rookies, all the rookie guys would go down and they eventually started taping it. So, with, you know, without anybody, without them knowing it, but the rookies would go down and hand, I'm, I'm here for my free turkey and uh, what's a rookie going to do with it anyway? He, he probably lives in a, like a one-bedroom apartment. He doesn't know. He makes sandwiches every day. But so he goes, to, and when they wouldn't give him the turkey, they get irate. And the funny thing was, we would get rookie coaches too. Send coaches down there to get turkeys. Uh, it, it was good. The best, the, the best one, though, was, um, well, there, there's, yeah, there's a lot. of But so uh, a, a good one. A good one was Kevin Fagan was a defensive lineman and his best friend was Pierce Holt, another defensive lineman. They would work out you know, every morning at like 6.30. They're in there, they're just huge guys, steroided up, you know, just <laughs> big, huge guys. And, and so our equipment guy, Ted Walsh, well, first of all, Fagan, Kevin Fagan was very jealous you could, his wife was really hot, and you couldn't talk about her. I mean, you couldn't even say, man, your wife is, he would get really upset. So you, you couldn't talk about Cindy, I think? Cindy Fagan, couldn't talk about her. And so our equipment guy, Ted Walsh, so Pierce Holt, Fagan are in the weight room. The two offices are right where the coaches are, are right there in the, in the weight room. Ted goes and calls the radio station that they have blaring. And it's like Lamont and Tonelli, I think it is. And they're crazy. And now they're big friends of the 49ers. But he calls and he says, look, can you play a song from Pierce Holt to Cindy Fagan? <laughs> and he says, sure, I can do that. He says, what do you want me to play? Feel like making love. So they we got a and Lamont plays it up, got a big request here. These guys really love each other. Pierce Holt out to Cindy Fagan. Go Niners, feel like making love. Oh my god. And Pierce Holt like has no idea what's going on. So Fagan chased him around the weight room. <laughs> there was there's there's a bunch of them, man. There's uh, if we have time that we in New Orleans every year. They'd pick a rookie and they would sign uh, in the program. They would always do like a, a little profile on one player. And so they would get a program, Ted Walsh, our equipment guy, get a program, sign the guy's name like it was an autograph and put it in a rookie's locker. And when the rookie came into the taping room to get, they would start talking about Hey, they're giving away a Cadillac to anybody that's got the autograph of whatever player. And they've misplaced it. They think they might have put it in our locker room. So somebody in here might have won a Cadillac. So the rookie, you know, everybody should check. So rookies who are really gullible go and look. And the dude, the rookie's got it, you know, and so he's all excited. And they, he'll, they wait for the whole game until after the game, they come in there, then, uh, what are you, you gonna go get your Cadillac? Or you, you, and then they finally tell him after the, so the guys think he, he's won a Cadillac, a $45,000 Cadillac for three hours. <laughs> and then they lower the boom on him. 
<laughs> Rookies are just bad, boy. <laughs> so gullible. What's the one thing that you would miss about your teammates today? You know, just even kind of having that kind of cohesiveness right yeah, now. There's a couple things that I miss about football. The, the playoffs are incredible because it's like so drastic. You lose, you're out. But when you win, it's so awesome, you know. Coming in the locker room, I mean, some of, the, some of the video of us coming in the locker room that first year when we had no idea we were that good, we didn't know Joe Montana was Joe Montana, and Ronnie Lott was the greatest defensive player of all time, and all, you know, but it, so, you know, winning playoff games was awesome. But just the, the locker room life, you spend so much time in the locker room, and all the joking around and kidding around is uh, the camaraderie over, over the years through, you know, bad losses. We, we got beat two or three times with Hail Marys by the Falcons. And you talk, I mean, that was hard to go through, but you went through it together. And then the, the euphoria of winning and all that, in that locker room with those guys, uh, all the, because everybody knows how hard everybody works. So to be in that locker room with good and bad times and the funny and, and all that, it's, it's pretty good stuff. Everyone always defines leadership and they, they talk about this person being a leader, that person being a leader. But in your guys' case, there may have been leaders, but was it really more getting the toxic people out so they weren't even around your group? Because you guys seem to just have a good confidence no matter what season it was. Yeah, we had, uh, we had great chemistry. Bill Walsh was so good at picking the right people with the right chemistry and getting rid of people that didn't fit. He, he was just really good at that. Joe Montana was a great leader, although he, he didn't say much. Uh, Ronnie Lott was really the vocal guy. If we had guys that were getting out of line, you could hear, you know, Ronnie, we didn't know, Ronnie was take, he would take them into the shower, back in the shower, and you could hear him screaming at this guy. It's echoing through the whole locker room. And so, you know, Ronnie Lott was our vocal leader. Ronnie Lott is one of the greatest guys in the world. I mean, he is just unbelievably awesome. And the most competitive person I've ever been around, and maybe some of you guys have heard this story, but he tore up his little finger uh, in a playoff game. And we had a playoff game the next week if we won, and we did win. So he tore up his finger, and so he tore the ligaments. And so he goes to the doctor on Monday after he finished playing the game, obviously, because he's just tough as nails. And so the doctor's examining it, and he said, yeah, you're going to have to have surgery. We'll fix that, but we can tape it up. If you take next weekend off and we win, then you can play the following week in the playoffs. And the doctor jokingly says, or I can just cut that part off and you can play next week. And Ronnie said, you can cut that off and I can play? And he said, yeah. He says, we'll cut it off. <laughs> and the doctor said, no, no, Ronnie, I, I can't do, I ethically can't. And Ronnie said, if I tell you to cut it off, you can cut it off. And if I can play next week, if you cut it off, I want you to cut it off. So they cut off the end of his finger so he can play in a frickin' football game. That's a bad dude. <laughs> I want him in my foxhole. Would you ever cut off a finger to Hell play? Hell no. <laughs> we had some guys that would miss games with hangnails. <laughs> Not Ronnie Lott. Ronnie Lott is a bad man. Uh, as you look back, is there anything that you would change about your career, or are you pretty satisfied to this point? Change? I would, I would have, I would have played a couple more years. The 49ers missed me so bad that the year I retired, they won back-to-back -back Super Bowls. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so yeah, I, uh, yeah, I would have played a couple more years. That would have been great. So what are some of the challenges for, you know, people that are actually in both this business and trying to get into, say, the op side of, you know, really making that transition full time? 
Okay, ask me. <laughs> no, but I'm saying from, Say the, from the player side, you've got to now move over. How do you move over successfully? Well, you, you, first of all, you're lucky if you get the opportunity. I just happened to be great friends with the owner, and he wanted me to work for the team when I retired, and I wanted to work for the team. I wanted to work for him, and I still work for him. Eddie Bartolo is he's an awesome dude. He's, a, he's just a great guy to be around, but... You got to have a way in. You got to you got to want to do it. That I don't think there's many guys that want to go into the management part, but there's a lot of players that want to go into coaching, and they know the game better than anybody. So players make, I mean, 90% of the time they make great coaches. Is it harder being on the op side than say even going on the broadcasting side and sitting there at the and being the color commentator, or is just one easier than the other? Uh, the TV stuff has got to be easy. <laughs> I mean, they, I, did, I did a little bit of TV when I retired, and they, uh, I, know all, you know, I knew all the coaches. I knew the 90% of the players, and the, the guys at Fox said, you know, you're not going to make it because you're not controversial enough. You're, you need to, like, get on these guys. I'm like, I don't think they deserve that. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'm just, yeah. But uh, TV's easy if you if you've got the guts to just criticize everybody you know because that's what they're looking for the uh the the op side is that's difficult it's a lot of work i know the tv guys put in a lot of work if they want to be good but it's tough when you when you're on the op side and you were a player and got and you've got to cut guys and they come in your office and you you know you're crushing their dreams and kicking them out of the league they're you know, they're used to making a bunch of money and now they're making nothing. And, uh, or they're, they're rookies and, I mean, you gotta cut 20 rookies sometimes. It's, that's just really, it's tough, you know, cause I had one guy that was, uh, he was a, just, he was a long snapper, Ralph Tam. And I called him in, you know, I said, you know, we're gonna go with a younger guy and Coach Seaford wants, wants to go this way, this direction. He cried for a little bit. He was in my office for like an hour and a half trying to talk me out of it. I said, it's not my decision, bro. <laughs> you know, so in, anyway, it's, it's tough when you have to let somebody go like that. So nobody's been successful enough to argue their way back on the roster? <laughs> well, it's, it's tough when George Seifert decides who leaves and I'm the one that cuts him. I can't, I can't change George Seifert's <laughs> decision. So it's, yeah, it, was, it made it easy. We had a little routine. <laughs> so let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, anybody have any questions they want to ask? Uh, you got Dwight Clark, you know, pretty famous. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> I don't follow it closely, but I don't have to follow it closely to know they're going to be badass this year. <laughs> they should be really, really good. Just as long as they beat South Carolina and Florida State, I don't really care about the rest of it, you know. <laughs> but they, they've got a chance. <coughs> Excuse me. They've got a chance to be good. Did you go to Clemson? Yes, sir. What years? Uh, 94 to 2000. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I hear you, man. I went back. After I went to the pros, I went back to Clemson. That's how much fun I was having. No, I still go back. Yeah. Must have been the girls, right? <laughs> A lot of girls. <clears throat> sure. Get out. He lives right down the street, you know. <clears throat> um, I mean, nobody will even know. In 1982, the final, the final game of the season, it was a strike-shortened year, and we were, we were three and five, and if we won that game, we were going to be four and five and go to the playoffs. And right, um, we had to kick a field goal against the Rams. 
So right before, to, to set up the field goal, right across the middle in a bunch of traffic, one-handed, you know, like they do now, one-handed uh, that set up the field goal that got blocked, so we didn't go to the playoffs. But, so that was the, to me, that was the best catch, because, you know, I'm on the ground, and one of those just reach out and grab it, one of those lucky things. But um, the, the best route of all time was in the, in the catch game, right before half, it was, it, we called it a fake shake, where you, you run like you're running a slant, and then act like you're going back to the corner. And when I acted like I was going back to the corner, Dennis Thurman is coached to turn and run to the corner and then look back. But when he turned and ran to the corner, I went back to the post. There wasn't anybody within 20 yards of me on either side. The only thing was, I missed the blitz. I was supposed to just run a slant. And so Joe's dodging and getting hit and all that, and he finally gets it off. If you, it's on, I'm sure it's on YouTube, but <laughs> what is it? Everything's right? on YouTube. Everything's on YouTube, <laughs> right. Yeah, Joe, Joe's awesome. Uh, I mean, he, to me, he's the greatest football player of all time. Um, so Joe didn't say a lot in the locker room. He wasn't going to get up in front of everybody and give a pep talk or any of that. But in the huddle, he was the, he was the man. He was in charge. He ran the show. He was telling everybody what to do, what to look for. He did a lot of talking in the huddle. Sometimes screaming, especially at Freddie Solomon. <laughs> Freddie, where are you going, man? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so Joe, Joe was awesome in the huddle. And then when he needed to, I'm sure you've heard the John Candy story, right before the final drive against Cincinnati in the Super Bowl to win the game, there's a TV timeout. There's like, I don't know, two minutes left. So we've got to drive all the way down. And, you know, Joe's sitting there. He's got the play already. They've already told him what they're going to run. They're just sitting there. And Joe can tell everybody's nervous, and, you know. And Harris Barton used to get the most nervous. So he's rocking and moving around. And, and Joe goes, hey, H, look over there, man. That's John Candy on the sideline. And Harris is looking. He's, and in Harris's mind, he's thinking, we're in the Super Bowl, and Joe Montana's pointing out movie stars on the sideline. <laughs> but, that, but Joe did it just to kind of calm everybody down. So that's the famous movie star play. Yeah, <laughs> right. No way. Yeah, I love it. I, you know, I obviously I was a receiver, so I like the throwing, but um, but I also I, I like old timey football. I I loved the, what Jim Harbaugh did with the 49ers. We ran it 55 percent of the time and threw it 45 percent of the time. To me, that's how you win. Um, it's fun. It, it's a great sport to watch. I, I've got two huge TVs. I just sit there and I can't, I just can't get, I mainline it. You know, I can't get enough. I Yeah. <laughs> right. So I, uh, I, I think it's great now. Um, I thought I was going to hate what they were doing to the uh, physicality. If, I hear them use that on ESPN. I don't even know if that's really a word. <laughs> but how physical the game was and how they're trying to make it better. And now after watching that for a couple of years, I kind of, you know, I kind of get it. And now when I wake up and I don't know where I am, I, I was like, damn, I wish they'd done this a long time ago. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I love the game the way it is. Um, I, I prefer the teams that run the ball more. I love the, the running game. Um, but uh, there's just not quarterbacks like, well, I'm sure there's some guys that are as good as Joe Montana, but Joe Montana was awesome with his accuracy. I see, I see these quarterbacks, even Peyton Manning, he throws the ball sometimes to these receivers that just get mashed. 
if Joe ever sent us in a spot where we got the crap beat out of us, you know, while by the time we pulled our helmet back around, Joe was down there to pick us up, you know, and say, sorry, man, you're all I had. It was third and five. I had to go to you. Bill taught all of us to, you know, find the open guy. And they, they throw into little windows now, and people, these receivers are just getting worn out. So th that's, uh, I don't understand that part of the game. It, it works. I mean, Peyton Manning, has, he's been very successful. And there's a, there's a lot of guys that, uh, that play like that, throw to little tiny windows. But Bill would, Bill would install plays, Bill Walsh would install plays, and he would say, if we call this against the right defense, you don't need to flinch or anything. Just catch it and go, because you're going to be wide open. And you're like, yeah, coach. They get, you didn't say this out loud, of course. You said, yeah, coach. You know, they, they have coaches, too. So we'd run the play in the game and catch it, and I'd turn around and get ready to be hit. There'd be nobody there. And then you got Joe Montana's accuracy. He would, he would tell me, he would say, look, when you run that hook, if the defender's coming from this side, I'm going to hit this number. If he's coming from this side, I'll hit this number to turn you up, feel away from getting turned right into the defender. And I was like, you can't do that with all that stuff going on back there. And so I started paying attention to it because when you're playing the game, you just catch it and go. But I'll be damned if he didn't hit numbers depending on what defender was the closest. He'd hit you the opposite way. So, I mean, I don't, maybe Tom Brady can do that with a deflated ball. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dwight, thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you guys for having lunch. Yeah. Thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah. Good job. Thank you. <laughs>